I am a Pommy. This is a podcast. Welcome to the Pommy podcast. Just a quick one before we get going. Um, if you want to reduce your yearly mortgage repayments by $5,000 and use that money to pay off your home loan uh, 10 years quicker, then my details are in the comments below. We're obviously going to put the guests details down as well. Dave, how you doing, mate? You good? How's it going, mate? You good? Good to catch up? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. How's, uh, what's the weather like in the UK? Uh, as you can imagine, fucking dog shit. Last time I saw you was uh, down Bondi Beach, wasn't it? So yeah, it's a bit of a change of uh, scenery from that. Yeah, that is a bit of a change. Well, to be fair, the weather, if I'm looking outside right now, the weather looks a little bit like a summer's day in the UK, so it's just a bit grey. And a bit like 20, 21 degrees, you know, that's as bad as it gets over here. Um, but you were in Australia for a little while. Yeah, mate. Uh, I, I, I left England and moved over there for a couple of years. Did the classic pommy thing uh, straight down to Bondi and didn't fucking leave for two years, basically. Uh, lived there, living the dream, playing for Waverley Rugby Club. And uh, yeah, I was gutted to come home, to be honest, but visa didn't work out and uh back to the cold back to the arctic mate yeah well you seem like you're doing now before we get into like everything that you're uh doing at the moment let's just like give everyone a bit of a background on you what was your upbringing like back in the uk where you're from all that type of thing yeah sweet mate so my name's dave um i've grown up in like cheshire which is a county sort of just south of manchester um my my parents were never together type thing, not, not that I remember. Um, so I've always been split between both. Uh, growing up, sort of, you know, school and everything like that, I was, I'd say at school I was a pretty chubby kid, to be fair. Uh, wasn't uh, wasn't very good at football. I was a little fat boy as well, actually. I was a little <laughs> fat boy as well at school. <laughs> well, damn. Don't be shy. Mate, they call, they call me, mate, they call me... They called me Scranners in the Marines. That was my like nickname, Scranners. I didn't want to say anything, mate, but uh, yeah. Um, we, uh, yeah, sort of uh, growing up around there, you know, everyone played football when I was younger, you know, that was the thing to do. And I wanted to go and play with everyone from school. So my dad took me to the local team to go and try with everyone. And um, after the session, the coach sort of, calls my dad over and he's probably thinking wow this is it you know he's been picked up this is his uh his his chance and the coach basically said yeah I wouldn't bother bringing him back here shite (laughs) so uh, (laughs) then started my journey into rugby mate basically um so my dad took me down to the local rugby club Altrincham Kersal um and I you know probably didn't get on with football because I like to get stuck in a little bit too much and because I was shit at football. Um, But first game away at Chester, knee deep in the snow uh, against these big chunky kids and everything like that. And it was horrible, but it was class and I loved it. That was the sort of route sports wise that I went down, I suppose. Yeah, I, I thought I did football as well because I was like from like a little village in Suffolk. Yeah. And there was there was only a football team, right? So it was like I just did football till I was about eleven, and then I got home one day, and my stepdad was just like there with a pair of boots, and he was like, "You're not fucking playing football anymore. Like <laughs> football <laughs> shit. It's not a good social. It's not a good social for me. You're crap at it. Um, <laughs> you're going to you're going to go you're going to go to, to rugby training tonight. Basically, they didn't have like a year group for my like my age. They just didn't have a coach that was willing to take the year group on. So I ended up playing for like the year above, which when you're in school is like a huge like weight weight size difference, isn't it? It's massive. So yeah, um, yeah, I yeah, it's huge. Yeah, so I was like, I just turned up. I the the team were playing in fucking uh, green and black, and I turned up with like bright blue socks on. And like just all the wrong colours. I just looked like a fucking idiot. I didn't know that you had to pass the ball backwards. I was fucking shocking. Like it was just, it was, but it was, it was one of the best things I did for sure. I ended up getting fucking shoulder surgery on my left shoulder um, just before I joined the core actually. But um, 
but yeah, I, I ended up going down the rugby route as well. So like, uh, uh, did did rugby? Were you, were you like disciplined as a kid? Were you were you sort of like at school and stuff? Like, did rugby help with any of that? A hundred percent, mate. I was. Uh, I've said this before, but I think it became obvious pretty early. I wasn't going to be an astronaut or anything like that. So you know, it was a pretty. Uh, <laughs> A one directional route was going to happen. You know, I, I like being, I like messing about. I like being outside and uh, I love the social of like rugby. I love being with the lads and everything like that and getting stuck in. It's good crack. Um, and I think, you know, it's, school never really did it for me. And, you know, for some people, that's what they want to do and they want to be an education. But I wasn't engaged enough. It was, I wanted to be the class clown. I wanted to piss about. Uh, I was getting in trouble quite a bit. Uh, I got caught, you know, you know, like selling sweets at school. It starts with that, doesn't it? And then you're fucking doing all sorts and whatever. Uh, set up a little operation with one of my mates. <laughs> and uh, we had blazers at school, you know, with like the little silk lining on the inside. And uh, my mate was like, oh, if, if you smash a, a pencil sharpener and you get the blade, you can make a little pocket here and you can just, you know, fill it full of stuff. I was like, all right, cool. So me and my mate were sort of going to the canteen at school and just loading up on sandwiches and cookies and drinks and then selling them out, out outside for half price. Um, a bit like Robin Hood, you know, sort <laughs> of stealing from the school, school canteen and then, you know, flogging them outside for a bit cheaper. So that didn't go down too well. Um, <laughs> And I suppose, like, you know, school was what it was. I had a bit of a stinking time, to be fair, at the start. I've always had a stammer my whole life. It's, it's pretty much gone now. And I got picked on a bit when I was younger, um, probably about 10, about, like, 10 years old, picked on by a kid in the year above who was in secondary school then, and I was in primary school. And my dad, you know, being, like, a ex-army sort of boxing bloke was like, right, we're going to get you a punch bag and we're going to sort this lad out. So <laughs> like, um, and I'm, he mustn't have taught me anything because I've broke my knuckles, all of them on my hands. So it's never, it's never really helped. But he took the piss out, out, out of me down the field. There it is coming out now. Fuck's sake. Yeah, that, that'll be a, a few laughs for, for the listeners, but um, <laughs> ended up, ended up sort of slotting this lad, hitting him, like sort of broke his nose. And, uh, at the time I was like, I was 10 and I panicked and I was scared because he was crying. So I just ran home. <laughs> I ran away from my first fight ever. I got home and like told my dad and he was like, that's my boy. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> hey, I did a similar thing, right? I, uh, I did a similar thing. I literally, I was getting bullied. I had, um, I had the worst teeth ever. Right. So I've, I've, I've always had like rabbit style teeth. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, I basically, <laughs> my teeth were fucked. Like they were all over the place. And I, I got, uh, I got train tracks when I, when I got, I got train tracks, right. I had, I had an impacted tooth up here, four teeth taken out. Like, I don't know. I must've got like my mum's teeth in my dad's mouth or something. Cause <laughs> like something went wrong as part of that, that part of me. Right. So <clears throat> I was this like chubby honking kid at school and um and uh i got train tracks right so i had like elastic bands in my mouth and like these braces but i played rugby at the same time so every month i was breaking my fucking it used to wind me right up i'd break i'd i'd like go to a rugby match break my braces go back to the orthodontist go was south african and he'd be like are you back again to get them fixed He's like, if you like, I think I've done it about fifteen times over two years. Like, it added an extra year onto my like, bully, basically getting bullied for fucking braces and whatever. Um, but yeah, I did a similar thing. I think, yeah, 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 exactly. But um, yeah, I remember, I remember, I used to get bullied quite a bit, and then um, I probably I did a similar thing. I was shit scared. Like, and this, this, I, I basically gobbed off to my mate and I was like, if this guy does it again, I'm going to hit him, even though I'd never hit anyone before ever. <laughs> so he'd done it again and I hit, and I hit him. And, um, and my mum, my mum, my mum and dad weren't together then. My mum obviously comes to the school and she goes up to, you know, you get put in like a room 
and then like you're both in there like the guy you've just hit's in there and yes. you're in there and the sim they're bin. like bring you bring you into the principal yeah yeah you're in the sim bin yeah and uh and my mum comes up the wooden staircase no one goes up the wooden staircase that's only if you're in trouble you go up the wooden staircase yeah, it yeah, leads yeah. right to the principal's office right so I go in there. And my mum just goes. My mum just goes. I'm not going to tell him off for this. Like we told you, he was getting bullied. Like blah blah blah. And they're like doing that. You know, you know, you you can't do this in school and blah blah blah. It was literally my first offence. Like I never got into trouble. Like I wasn't like I wasn't. I was probably opposite to you. I was just quiet at school and I just sort of like a bit of a grey man. They said that I was that through training as well. Like I just didn't gob off. I just did my minimum and went home. Um, but yeah, my mum was like, they suspended me for two days, put me on principal's report or whatever it was that you get put on. You have to get stamped that you're a good boy for two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the, the poor lad had a fucking broken snout. And um, ah. yeah, my mum just basically, let, my mum just basically made me hoover the house and play PlayStation for three days. That was my punishment for it. Um, Sounds like hell. So, but yeah. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, this is great. I might do a bit more. Me and some other lads from school got put on that report card. And this is like school bits, isn't it? But, you know, you have to get it. You have to show your parents and then you have to get it stamped, don't you? And uh, to not yeah. – I couldn't get it stamped by the teacher because we weren't we weren't behaving well enough. So we stole the stamp from one of the teachers so we could stamp it ourselves. And then I didn't take it to my mum because I didn't want her, her to see. So we practised our parents' signatures so we could sign it ourselves. And we're like, we don't even know who, who we're kidding with this. <laughs> Stamps and signatures all over the place. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> Forging so, mate, your principal's certificate, get like your card. Yeah, 100%, mate. I think, though, yeah. like, you know, sort, sort of growing up that age and around that area, and a lot of people were going down, like, one, well, one way or another. There was, there was a lot of people who were out messing around and you know going down the wrong way and then there was all the people who wanted to go to sixth form and go to university and and like do this and that the sort of i guess the normal traditional route that most people do and most parents want for the kids but yeah like most bootnecks that i speak to it was in my mind from a young age that that's just what i was gonna do like i always wanted to do that from being young i actually got told off in class i was in like one of the lessons and uh you were going to be doing work and I was writing lines out and I was writing the uh, Victoria Cross winners for my interview because I was having to take a day off from school to go to my interview. And I was writing lines out like uh, Corporal John Pretty John over and over and over. And they're like, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't need school. This is what I'm going to do when I leave. And they were just like, no, you're not. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Took yeah. you off me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as as everyone, every you know, like most young lads still went and sort of did it. And uh never look back but you know a couple of times i thought to myself so did you, you know, join you... sorry mate just to interrupt did you join so did you join immediately out of school yeah so i messed around for a few months um my application took a while messed around for two or three months and then i was uh i actually got my first job at uh, at mcdonald's place of the champions uh, where all good careers start and uh, my preparation Mac for the sauce. Marines, mate. Yeah, I was just cycling to Mackey's, having like a Big Mac and chips and every day and then cycling back, doing press-ups, pull-ups, and that was pretty much me, like, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, in hindsight, you do things a lot differently. But I suppose there wasn't really... You didn't have stuff back then. You didn't have Strava. You didn't have, you know, as much uh, easily accessible information and things. But, yeah. Straight from yeah, school. Just a stop watch, mate. That was it. That was it, mate. Yeah, not even that. So you, um, you, you walked, you walked into the print, you walked into the careers office. Um, you would have been what, fifteen at the time? I, was, I think it was fifteen, 15 and, and nine, three months, quarters, fifteen and ten months. Yeah, that whatever the youngest age was, you could go. And were you? Did they? Did they? Did they try and deter you at that point? Did they say you're too like you're underweight? Because I remember, I remember when you actually get into training. We'll come on to that in a bit. When you get into training, there are lads that were like obviously younger, smaller, and they'd have to put them on shakes. Remember the extra shakes they'd get to try and fatten being them up. Being <laughs> it was underweight, weird, wasn't it? Looking back on being it, underweight like, wasn't yeah. an issue, mate. I was, <laughs> I was all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was fine. <laughs> so, 
Did you manage to pass your maths exam or did you fail that? No, um, the, the only thing that I was that I almost threaded was was the interview because of my stutter, and it, it came on more when I was uh, when I'm nervous. So it was coming on real bad, and I was thinking during this, like, can he actually can he fail me here? Because you know, because my stutter, it, it, it was bad during uh, during the interview, and I was like, you know, but he was really nice to me. This bloke, really kind, really like reassuring and calm me down and everything and stuff like that. And you've never done a job in, interview before, really, you know something you really want to do um but i knew mm. all, all of the history i had it all down to the t i knew ev- everything but it was just getting the words out was a struggle but um no sort of past mm. that uh got myself down to training uh 2009 and um was the youngest lad in our troop how did you find how how did you find sorry how did you find the um the pre Royal Marines course. Yes, because a lot of people that are listening to this, yeah, they wouldn't know, right? You've got to do it. You've got to do a pre course before you actually get, you can't just sign up to the Marines. No, like that's, true. that's, that's not true. how it works. You got, you got to go, you got to go to a careers office, get interviewed, pass fitness tests at a gym, at a local gym. Then you got to, then you got to get assigned when they think you're ready to go on a pre Royal Marines course, which is like a, yeah, three day course right isn't it and there's like mm-hmm. mate some of the lads you meet on that course you think who sent you here <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who sent you here you can't run a kilometer <laughs> like what are you doing down here like yeah and there's lads leaving on day one how did you find the pre the pre-course i was all right so i was lucky enough the the gym that i trained in back at home uh the cosmos it's quite like a famous gym round here not because it's a big you know big gym but it's like a old rusty bodybuilder gym and the blokes in there are just massive and there was like loads of massive blokes with like the uh a commando dagger marines tattoo loads of them in there you don't always see them and it's good in inspiration but there was this other, other lad there training um and i thought he would he would he was already in the Marines because he kind of looked the part and he was on the same uh, interview uh, that I was. I was like, I definitely recognize you. And we were on the same interview, the same Royal Marine acquaint day, same potential course and same troop, same all of it. So we like trained together and we got into quite a decent shape. We were hitting top scores on all the body weight stuff, you know, really good scores. Um, all right, we're running uh, sort of middle of the pack so I, I was going there feeling confident. I was in a good place anyway, you know. Um, I knew I was going to pass it. Mm. Um, we actually, no, it wasn't being cocky or anything like that, but it was sort of more of a, I wasn't legally allowed to drink yet. And we sort of knew we were going to pass and uh, went to the shops and bought a bottle of uh, Sambuca and took it with me. And we were like, <laughs> we'll have this on the train coming back, you know, and I st- still was like 16 and, <laughs> We passed and we saw this bottle of, of Sambuca off like before we got to Birmingham. We're steaming. Like, yeah, it's good. But it was, it, it's hard. It's Went hard to EX4 day. on the way home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it, it's a hard three days, you know, if, you, if you're not ready for it. Um, you do like all, all of your gym tests, you press up sit-ups, pull-ups. You do like your bleep test, the high obstacle course, the swimming test, uh, determination test. Um you do quite a bit, don't you? And I think it was about a yeah. 50%, 50% pass rate. I think quite a lot failed. Yeah, we had about, it was it was roughly around a 50% pass rate. I was, um, it's funny because you, ter- you turn up, don't you? And like, I, I was in decent shape, but I wouldn't say I was like jacked at that point. I didn't get mm-hmm. jacked until I went to Scotland and then I got jacked. But, um, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, when I joined, I was just like a chunky rugby player, right? So uh, that went to the gym quite a lot. Um, so yeah, you, I, I was probably a bit, I was probably very similar to you actually. Like I could never get a sub nine minutes on my bloody yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. one and a half miler. I got 9.04 or something was my best ever. I think that was it. And I can't, I just couldn't hit eight. And then you'd see the other lads that are like smash it in seven something or seven the something, early eight minutes. Yeah. And you'd just yeah. be like, well, what the fuck? Like, how do you do that? Um, but yeah, like, but yeah, but basically like everything else, I was fine. So the endurance course thing was piece of piss. Like they did like a bit of pays to be a winner. 
around the endurance course, don't they? Um, uh, so I was like good at sprinting and stuff like that. So that was fine. As long as it was short distance, I was all right. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you do, you, you kind of pass your swim, like, but like you, you're hanging out a little bit, but you pass your swim, that's okay. Um, and then you go down to the bottom field and do the determination. I remember actually uh, that determination test, there were two lads um, just hanging out. Like, try, I think they made us crawl the 200 meter stretch of the um, bottom field. And yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah. I think it was around September time or something. I can't remember when it was. It was quite cold. Um, and these two lads were just like not moving. And it's like the last thing you do. Like it's the, la it's the very last thing you do. I was like, well, they can't, they're not going to do it all day. Like we can't stay out here all fucking day. Um, so I just kept crawling in the middle of the pack. I thought if I can't, if, if I'm, if I'm not seen and I'm in the middle, no one's going to pick me up. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like if I'm not, if I'm not at the front, the instructors aren't going to be like gobbing off to me. And if I'm not at the back, they're not going to be screaming at me saying, hurry up. So I just sort of like, I'll just stay in the middle and do the average on this. Um, mm. And these two lads like quit about 90 seconds before the end failed the oh. course. I was oh. just like, how do you like, oh, I just looked at them both. I was like, oh, sucks to be you. Come down here for a whole weekend and you failed on your last 90 seconds. Um, a long train home. But yeah, it was good. Like I, <laughs> a long train journey home. What a waste of time. Um, I just thought like you got, I just wanted to pass it in one go rather than doing it twice. Like I just thought, well, just whatever you got to do to get through it once, then that's fine. But yeah, similar 50% failure rate on that and then i the i remember getting the um we, we had we had there was an injured uh commando at the um careers office so he drove us down cat caught up with some mates went on the piss on the weekend and we we were doing our thing and then he drove us back um so he got us all to ring immediately to the careers office and say like get us on the next course so i think i had six weeks and then i was on like the next one um mm -hmm. What troop, well, just out of interest, what troop number were you? 990, 990 troop. 990, yes. So I was I was maybe 20-something troops behind you. Yeah, I was okay. 119. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was, um, we, had quite <laughs> good, we had quite a good troop, to be fair. We had some really good lads, and uh, our training team were sort of spot on, you know, really good guys. And, I mean, you, you get to training, don't you? And like 60 odd of you that start and I think there was like 11 that finished for us like you do lose a lot pretty quick you know like and lose some in the first few yeah. weeks and everything like that and the attrition rates yeah carnage and you know you think back and I I fucking struggled in training mate I won't even deny that in the slightest it was all uphill like because I was really keen to get there and everything and sort of knew a lot about what was going to happen, but not, um, I think being so young, you're not mentally prepared. You're not physically prepared because your body is not ready for that. There's just no, you aren't, you aren't ready, but I think being so tired and also I just could not retain the information quick enough. I was struggling to take things on and you're just always mm -hmm. up, up against it. And I think, it was easy to take things to heart a lot. Like now, being 30-odd, you know it's all all a game. They're going to call it's everyone all, the worst yeah, player yeah. they've ever seen and blah, blah, blah. But I'd go back to the to the grots at night and it'd sit on my head and I'd be like, oh, no. Like, you know, really let it get to me. And uh, But, you know, I think if you go there with the mindset of, I'm not going to quit. I'm just going to keep going until someone says, that's you, you know, and you'll pass eventually, you know, that like, as long as you don't give in and you don't get injured, but uh, keep yourself out of sick bay. That's massive. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's the main one, right? Is it's um, a lot of lads get like mentally um, in their head. They're like, I fucked up on something and it sits in their head, right? For yeah. a good few days. Um and there, it'll be something silly, won't it? It'll be like, I don't know, you didn't do hospital corners on your bed. Or you didn't do a when you forgot to do a Wednesday bed. Oh God, you're you know, and then your your duty your duty your duty corporal would be fucking just picking you up for tiny little things. Or they'd get you later on. The worst I found the worst ones were not necessarily the first eight weeks, twelve weeks of 
just everyone got thrashed for every stupid little thing. It was later on when you were supposed to be, um, you're getting to the point where you're about eight weeks away from finishing and they yeah. pick you up for something and then they fucking shame you in front of everyone else on the staircase. <laughs> And you'd be sitting there and you'd be like, oh, what a dickhead. Why did I forget to do that? Yeah. yeah like, yeah. I remember getting to like week 30. I got to week 30, like two weeks away. I think, no, it wasn't actually. It was after the commando tests. So you do the commando tests and then you've got yeah. what you forget is a lot of people think you get your commando test, you get your lid, you're done. You're not done. You've got a week, a shit week of drill training after that, haven't you? It's yeah, fucking yeah, horrible. Yeah. horrible. Just in those drill boots for six hours a fucking day, every day like it's shit and just bullying boots. So, um, I, I remember like, they obviously knew, like my training team obviously knew like that lads just slack off after they get their green lids. Right. Cause you come over the hill, you, you go over the bridge, you get your, you get your green beret after your 30 miler. And then the following week you're like, Oh, I can just, you know, I don't need to do a Wednesday bed anymore. I don't need to do hospital corners anymore. I don't need to, you know, do all this type of thing. I've passed now. And they'll yeah. pick you up. I remember like on the Wednesday, two days before pass out, like our corporal just, he brought us up onto the landing and he was like, you fucking pieces of shit. Like, <laughs> like you think you haven't fucking passed training yet? And we're all sitting there like, oh my God, like how have we fucked up? That Like we're supposed to be going to units next week. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like we're yeah, we're yeah. in with the big boys now, and we've fuck we fucked it on the final week, and the the amount of guilt that goes. I remember you have to go, you have to get punished, and you go down to do um drill at like eleven p.m. at night. Oh God, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they down in that drill shed. Do you remember they like send you? you they'd like send you off by yourself, and you'd half the time you'd turn up, and no one would be there. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that massively happened. They just think- fucking literally just fucking you around all the time. <laughs> doesn't help like i was in uh the section i was in in training everyone was like really good we were like a section of pretty much uh originals and um the lad that i mm. sort of bivvied up with th- uh, throughout training i think they put like the youngest lad with like the oldest lad and he was rock solid like troop diamond really good you know all over it being honest he dragged me through a lot of it you know when when you're struggling being young and um I think you don't notice how many people get flanked on exercise. And flanked is like, if you fuck up, you get sent to the side, you have to do loads of fizz for like people that like don't know. And it's like a punishment. Yeah. So, um, so, so basically what will happen is you're, you're on an ex, you're on an exercise, right? Every morning you have to do a kit muster, don't you? So you, yeah. do, you do an inspection every morning, you lay out all of your kit. If there's one fucking thing wrong and they will find something. Then, yeah. then you get put over to the you get put over to what they call the flank, and then you get ready for a, for basically what they call a thrashing for correctional whatever. fizz. But yeah, sorry, yeah. go on. Just what I'd explain. Correctional fizz. Yeah, sorry, carry on. Yeah, <laughs> I think you don't notice how many people get flanked because you're there and it's dark and you're scared. But because the lad I was bivying up with was so good. And he never got flanked. It just felt like it was always me. You know, like I was like every, because I'm, I'm pretty sure I got flanked every single time as well. Every time. I don't, I don't remember not getting flanked, you know. And at the time you're like, oh my God, like what have I got to do to not, because you've tried, you've spent three hours preparing this thing, haven't you? You've done everything. You've done it all. And it's all clean and it's perfect. You look at it, you're like, it's the cleanest thing I've ever seen in, in my whole life. And they'll come and, I'll get that, I'll get like that, I'll get, what is that? And you're like, it's mud, it's dirt. And they're like, oh, God. You piece of shit. It's so demoralizing, isn't it? And, you know, I remember it happened to us on Dartmoor on that uh, 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 Hunter's Moon, and it was sideways rain on the morning, like absolutely horrendous rain. And he was like, why is your kit mustard wet? And I was like, it's raining. And he was like, right. Do you see that hill? Do you see that hill there? And I was like, oh my God. He went, well, there's another hill behind it. Fucking go to that. And you're just like, oh. It was absolutely <laughs> it was shit in your pants. Yeah, we had yeah. a, on, um, I think we, Hunter's Moon is where you do your night night navigations, isn't it? For the first the time. Survival. The Pretty survival. The survival stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So we had, so we had, we actually, we were all, all of us still in a group um, uh, on WhatsApp. 
and we talk about it like every now and then it will pop up once a year. We used to call it dark. We called it dark Tuesday because basically, I don't know if you remember the, that was one of the only places where, um, the training team, they had like a building that they could go and sleep in. Yeah. And we could smell like bacon sandwiches in the morning. And I was like, you fucking wankers. Um, <laughs> and, and we'd just come off like night navigation, 16 hours, yomping, whatever it was. Um, and then it was like sideways rain. So it was torrential, mate. It was horrendous. And they bivvied us up in some like almost like boggy swamp. So like yeah. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and I put my hand down and I was basically just sleeping in a puddle. I thought I was going to die that night. I was like, I'm not going to survive the night. Like, this is not going to happen. And we lost about 11 blokes on that. We lost about 11 blokes on that one exercise. Jesus. But like you say, like you say, we, um, I, I, I got flanked at every single possible exercise point yeah. before that on every yeah. single thing. Right. So like week two or week three, where you go out and you're basically just camping overnight. It's you're fucking useless. You don't know anything. Yeah. Um, I actually had a good kit, had a good kit muster, but then he went, he decided to go into my rubbish. So you have to put all your rubbish in like a Ziploc in your top, in the top of your bag or wherever it was. Mm. So he, he goes, get your rubbish out. I've got my breakfast out. He got my breakfast out, got my spoon, and then put the spoon in my breakfast and was like, what's that? I was like, it's baked beans, <laughs> baked beans, corporal. Like, try and not breakfast. fucking laugh. Like, it's baked, um, it's baked beans, corporal, <laughs> breakfast. Yeah. He's like, do you not need those calories? And I was like, oh, shit. He's like, okay, so if we have to go on a 60-mile yomp right now and you go down because you haven't had enough fucking calories, and we all have to pick you up and drag your sorry ass because you didn't eat your entire breakfast. I was just sitting there like, oh my God, like what the fuck is going on here? I'm a piece of shit for not eating my breakfast. Like basically yeah. like, yeah. but then every week after that, I'd fuck up. And we got to this hunter's moon, I had this shit night, fucking horrendous, woke up in the morning and this, this, the stripey was like shouting at me and the wind was going sideways and it was so bad. I couldn't hear him. And he was literally three meters away from me. Could not hear a fucking word that he was saying because it was Jeez. just like, whoosh, like coming in. Um, anyway, they didn't do a kit muster because they were like, the weather's so bad, but they wanted to, they wanted to strip our weapons. And I made sure that I oiled up the day before, fucking oiled up everything the night before, before I went to bed. So he checks everything off and it's fine. And he checks it again and it's fine. And I'm thinking, yes, fucking yes. Like, this is going to be the one where I don't Maybe. get flanked. And then, right, but then he goes around all the other lads and they all get flanked. And I'm like, yes, there's only two of us that have actually got a clean weapon. Yeah. Everyone else has fucked it. Like there's rust on it. There's rain. There's wet. Like they're, they've left their weapons in puddles and shit. And they all go over to the side. And then he comes and stands over to us and he goes, what do you think you should do, lads? And we look over at the guy who's about to get thrashed and he's like, yeah, you can fuck off over there as well. <laughs> and oh, I was like, oh Even if you get it right, you're going to get flanked. So we're just like, I thought oh, this is the first time I've actually done it right. And I, I still get fucking punished. So it is what it is. I just used, I used to think of it as extra fizz. That's 100% the point, mate. Like, um, you know, they always do uh, uh, pays to be a winner. <laughs> There was uh, yeah. uh, the fixed lad in our troop who, who ended up getting King's badge. He used to come first every single time. And I don't know what it was, mate. On this one day in like week 20 odd, they were like, pays to be a winner. And I was never the winner. I wasn't up there. I was in the sort of like, you know, second bit. And something just turned and I was like, this is it. This is my one. I'm, I'm going to win this one. That's it. I can't, I can't do this more than once. So I have to win this <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah. You know, like I have to. And I went and I gave it, you know, you never give a hundred percent because you, you, you know, you don't want to go again. And I gave it everything. I was like, ah, the faces and everything. Ah, <laughs> trying to get there. I was up and I was like, oh my God, oh my God. And he came past me at the end. And I was like, no. <laughs> and then they're like, everyone else go again. And because I'd given it so much, I was just last for every single one then. Just at the back. <laughs> just like, oh, you know. <laughs> couldn't even get anywhere near and I'm just like the one time that I absolutely yeah. give it my all and just miss out and then wrote yourself off for the rest of them and you're just like oh shouldn't have bothered <laughs>
Mate, threaders, threaders. Um, so you, so about eleven of you guys left at the end of training. Um, how did you find the commando tests? Yeah, mate. So, uh, being honest, struggled with them all. Apart from the nine mile speed march, that was the only one that I found easy because it's just you know it's not that bad. But you do the run throughs prior to it, don't you? And pretty much our whole troop had passed. And I think there was me and one other lad who hadn't passed anything until the day. Like we hadn't passed a single test in, in like the run throughs. And I don't know if they give you the exact time or what, you know, but I wasn't close. Like, you know, like it wasn't like seconds, it was minute. And I was like, oh, you know, like I was flapping big time. And on the endurance course, uh, I was panicked about it. I had a few mates that, that were in Hunter. Um, who I was friends with prior to going in, who I'd known anyway, and they were from different troops. And I'd go and see them at night and chat with them and, and all of that. And um, I was saying like, you know, I'm I'm worried. I don't know whether I'm going to pass and all this. And it was winter for us. It was like January. So it's freezing and uh, running down the lanes, you know, coming down. It was all icy, trying not to slip and your hair's frozen on the endurance, you know, because of the water running down, trying not to mm. slip. And that, uh, you get down the lanes and my mates that were in Hunter met me down the lanes and ran back with me. Like, like, like Jen as well. Like, no, you probably shouldn't, like probably shouldn't say, <laughs> but yeah, they were like, come on, come on. And they uh, take it off, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Fuck you. My, uh, PTI <laughs> who, um, uh, ran a bit with me. He was a really sound bloke. I, I ended up playing for the core rugby team with him and he ran some with me. Past the endurance, skin of my teeth type thing, really, uh, being honest. Nine miler, sound, didn't find that too bad. It's just a nine mile jog, isn't it? You know, with with kit on. Uh, Tarzan, found horrendous. Like, really fucking, it is, that's hard, isn't it? It's the shortest one, but it's hard. Um, <clears throat> and the 30 miler, I have got no idea what happened, but I was, I dropped back by the first checkpoint sort of six six miles in i was already hanging out um mm. everything my whole body just just nothing just absolutely nothing i just could not keep up just you know how how much you try your body just won't do it and my corporal john platt top bloke was the only man to run to the first checkpoint uh the six mile point and then get the coach to the 24 mile point or the minibus whatever and then run us the last uh, uh uh, sort of six miles in and I dropped yeah. back and he said, um, I'll, I'll run with you, you know, let's, uh, let's catch up. And I never caught up and he ended up running the whole 30 miler with me, the entire thing just by himself, um, <laughs> to, to get me round. Um, and a color stripe, the, uh, color stripe that was running it was like, that's it. Pull him off. He's, he's done, that's it, finished. And and John Platt was like, no, no, he's not. I'll get him round. He's like, you fucking stand down, you're a corporal. And he was like, no, on my head be it. Fucking leave us to it. And he was like, you are in fucking trouble big time. You know, and he left us. And I'm running like, <laughs> and John's like, <laughs> and John's like, mate, we have got to catch up now big time. And I'm like, I know, I know, I know. And he's like, no, seriously. He said, I was only meant to run the first six miles. I didn't check the map this far, so I'm just sort of cuffing it now. <laughs> I was like, yeah, right. <laughs> Sounds. <laughs> just trying to get there. Um, <laughs> and we caught up by the last checkpoint. We caught them up at the 24, 25 mile point, sort of whatever. And um, I made it in with them, like passed. And my corporal came up to me afterwards and said like, I've never, ever seen someone struggle that much and still pass, which was meant to be an insult, but I was like, I'm taking that as a compliment all day. You know, it's finished. Now. <laughs> Whatever, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he yeah. looked after me, though, in training, I think, because I was like the the youngest lad. He used to pull me to the office, not do weird things to me because I was young, uh, but he just asked me stuff. Oui. And, uh, yeah, he was like, you know, I was honest. I said to him, like, you know, I know I'm not the best here. I know I'm not natural at anything, really. Everything comes hard to me, but I want to be here and I won't quit. I want to be here more than anyone and I, I won't quit. And I think you just like that mm -hmm. and sort of looked out for me. Um, you know, you've still got to pass everything, but he definitely helped me. Uh, we still speak now. He's a really good bloke. And uh, my dad bought him a, 
a uh, beer at like King Squad and everything like that. And a really good blow, you know, like sticks in, in my mind now to this day. But yeah, past training, mate. And uh, still to this day, I'd say the biggest accomplishment of my life, I think, like the, the biggest thing to achieve. And I, th- I think most bootnecks say that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, 100%. It's not. Uh... It's mad because if you knew what you if 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 you knew what if you knew what it was, if you if you actually knew what it was, like people have seen the fucking Channel Four shows and you know the what was it called Commander on the front line and all that type of thing where you you can you watch the lads go through training, but yeah. that this, it, there's so much shit that happens off camera that yeah. is not would never be allowed on camera that you have no fucking idea. Like mm-hmm. it's. It's not unless you actually do it and you understand how much sleep deprivation you get, how many punishments you get, how many weekends you get taken off you, how many lads that that you thought were the top five that were definitely going to pass, cream in like week 16. And you look back and you go, fucking hell, I just, I just, I just kind of kept my head down and carried on going. Um, It's, you know, it's, it is a big, it's a huge achievement, like a huge achievement. Um, and I, I think I was, we were quite lucky as well. We had a really good training team. Like every bloke, every bloke on the training team inspired me. Definitely. Yeah. They were like, I definitely looked up to every single one of them. I still talk to quite a lot of them. Like I've got as Facebook friends and, and stuff like that. And I think they get an attachment with you as well, right? Because they've seen you from super shit at the start to all the way to like, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're going to end up working with you potentially on the front line, um, or at a unit or whatever. Um, and you bump into them, don't you? you? Like along the way, you bump into them as part like throughout your career and you're like, fucking hell, I'm working alongside the guy that trained me now. It's a bit like surreal. Um, yeah. cause you looked up to them so much, um, go, going through, going through training. Where did you go? So you obviously, obviously passed, um, by the fucking uh by the skinny of teeth <laughs> and, uh, and then where did you go where did you go after that so obviously you get choice right you get a choice but whether you actually get your choice or not is basically up to whoever so pretty much everyone in our troop was putting in for four two um and my my corporal john platt had been at, had been at four five and i think me and three other northern lads all all put in for for four five um, ninety percent of our troop went went to four two, and a few of us went to four five. Uh, everyone got their first choice. Um, he just spun dits about it, and being honest, I wanted to dodge you Southerners like the plague and just, just sort of get up with some Northern lads, you know, and uh, shoot the shit <laughs> beyond the wall. No, I, I, I don't know what it was, you know. Like, um, I think four five have got a bit of a reputation, haven't they? You know, um. The sort of bad lads and you know they wear the rig a little bit different they wear the lid a little bit different and um yeah i just wanted to get up, up there so went straight up uh sort of got off the train um and i met this lad at the train station uh six foot four six foot five asian looking lad uh called uh uh, called Callan Too Good, still one of my best mates to this day. Um, and me and him got the same troop, and we were the same age then. We were both like like sixteen, and we had to march up to our troop sergeant like the next morning and introduce ourselves. And um, the whole troop stood there together. Loads of them have, have just been Afghan together, you know, been there years. Big blokes with tattoos and too young. 16 year old lads whatever come marching up and you can hear them like who the fuck's that who the fuck's that and you're like oh my Fre- god fresh meat fresh meat that's it yeah and i marched up well he he marched up first and because like his his mum's malaysian and his dad's essex so he's like the tallest asian person you've ever seen with like an essex geezer accent so he's like he introduced it himself and he went, right, you're now called Noodles, fuck off. He's like, all right, sweet. And I got to the front and I didn't even get one word out. I was just stuttering really bad and pulling the faces and doing everything. And everyone started laughing. I was like, oh, God. No. I was like, really? and my sergeant was like, oh, fuck's sake. He's like, what the fuck was that? And I was like, uh, I've got a stutter. Well, I was trying to say that. I was just like, Ugh. and he was like, 
right, fuck off mumbles. And then it was noodles and mumbles from sort of day one, like these two little weirdos <laughs> and this big giant freak and this guy that can't talk. And then like, what have they sent here, you know? Um, but yeah, straight in, straight off to Canada for a, f- a few months um, and back doing training. And yeah, it, it, it was quite busy from, from uh, straight away, really. Did you... Um... So obviously, um, Canada first, you go and do your join and run. You, you're kind of like in the pack after your join and run. The, the lads have got some respect for you at that point. Um, when did you when did you head out? Did you head out uh, to Afghan first? Was that your first sort of operation? That big one? Yes, yeah, so I, I, I did some trips. I did like Canada and um, something else. And prior to Afghan, you do your acclimatization training. Um so we went to Salisbury during December, <laughs> fucking minus five or something like that. Just absolutely Baltic. In no way good prep for Afghan. Uh, yeah, no. the, the army goes to Kenya and we go to Salisbury Plain. So um, we did that. I'd actually, I volunteered to be a, a BCR, a battle casualty replacement for 40 commando on Herrick 12 and I'd done all of the beat up training with them and I was pretty much good to go. Um, and they found out I was 17, so I I couldn't go. I I couldn't, I couldn't deploy, but I'd been down Portsmouth, done the whole op tag, done everything ready to go and then didn't get sent. So ended up going on Herrick 14, operation Herrick 14 with four, five commando, uh, straight out, Nadali Green Zone, Helmand Province, um, Afghanistan, which statistically was like the most dangerous place on earth at the time. Um, sort of straight out there at 18. I was like the youngest person out there. I'm sure there was a, f- a few more lads that, that were 18, but it's the minimum age. Uh, straight out, did some training, uh, sort of like getting used to the heat. I mean, it was 53 degrees on like the hottest day. So stinkingly hot you know uh and obviously the lads uh, 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 sort of straight away everyone naked baby oil on factor zero let's let's cook let's go uh as everyone does um straight out to our sort of pb after two weeks yeah like pb's your patrol base and i was a section like a long range rifleman and sharpshooter um we've been on the we've been out there a week uh and went on our first company up uh sort of like a company strength a week in and a big show of force all of our vehicles all of our helicopters all of our lads out to show that we're here and we mean business whatever we've been out for like eight hours something and it's hot hanging out stinking and we've gone firm next to this compound wall. So we've like taken a knee and everyone's checking arcs and looking around and like whatever and been there ages, you know, and everyone's starting looking at you and bits and bobs and you get a feel for the, uh, 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 for the atmospherics and you think like this doesn't feel totally right, but you're not sure, you know, you haven't been there long enough to have a good appreciation of what's normal and what's not. So stand up and the point man on our patrol one of the lads says, ah, oh, someone's just uh, just poked the head out of this compound. I'm going to follow them in. And we get taught not to do that because they couldn't like poke the head out and act surprised and go, ah, oh. and then you follow them in and they've laid a little trip wire and bump. Everyone fucking is gone. So we're told not to, because it's meant to be a, a uh, come on. But he started following. And then we just heard this. And we're like, fuck the fuck was that and i was disorientated completely like didn't know where i was didn't know what was going on everything's spinning and just a bit like what like completely out of it and i I looked down and my trousers were all like shredded and there was just blood all over my legs and coming out my legs and uh, there's blood coming down my arm i had blood in like my my face and my neck like a thing at the side here and uh, i was fragged up a uh, grenade had basically come over the wall. They'd rolled it over and I didn't see it, but it rolled by my feet. And obviously uh, 
a grenade's got a sort of kill radius of five meters and a maim and seriously injure of 15 meters. And the medic told me it was one and a half meters away from me, but it rolled off the hard track and got into the soft mud next to me, which had took a lot of the blast and probably, well, 100% say, saved my life. Um, the medic said if it had stayed on the track, pretty much all of us would have been, you know, dead. So pretty lucky, but at this point I've got frag down my neck. I've got a piece of metal sticking out my shin bone, bit of frag, whatever it is. Uh, and the lads have come around putting like, uh, FFDs on me, uh, first field dressings, trying to get me squared away. We're trying to take arcs and check for enemy positions, enemy in, in depth and all of that and check for threats. And then the next plan was to Kazivak and to get me out to the MSR, the main supply route. And the Sergeant Major was going to pick me up in his quad bike, uh, uh, the God Quad, we all called it. And we had to navigate over this open ground and the lads were checking for IEDs. And once they made the safe lane, we could sort of run across. So I'm there with my sharpshooter, my big rucksack, fucking blood all over me. And I'm trying to hobble my way out on this one dodgy leg and we get to this wadi like a stream um and you're like uh, uh, you know streams back here in england are a little bit dirty but not too bad but in afghan they shit in them they piss in them everything you know you you shouldn't go in them and uh the medic said with your leg being like that if that leg goes in you are gonna get fucking sepsis and that's gonna be you type thing so Jump over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't land on your bad leg. All right. So, bloke, classic. You know, don't land on your, don't land on your, land on your bad leg. I don't even know what I was thinking, mate. I just ran and jumped all my way onto my bad leg, and I felt the piece of frag. I felt it go into my shin bone. I felt it go in like a white oh. hot needle. Um, my leg just buckled from under me. I went down. And it was like, it was, it was, it was pain. It was white hot pain, but it was more just like, I'm going to faint here. You know, just ugh. stood up. Yeah. yeah going, into shock at, going into shock at that point. Yeah. 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 Big time. I've got myself out. I've got to the road and the Sergeant Major's come. He's like got his quad bike on the back. He's got a big metal bin and he's just like, throw the cunt in. So I'm in the back. He's like, he's taking arcs, arcs to the front, driving like that. And he told me to take arcs to the rear. So I was sat sharpshooter like that and we're just driving down this road just pretty slow you know like slow for a bit and then he's just gone Wah! and just giving it some all the way back and i'm thinking i hope there's no ieds here <laughs> it's really like, <laughs> <I've got> back... <laughs> yeah uh, uh got back to the pb and the medic started sort of cracking on um everything like that he was like do you want some morphine uh, uh the sergeant major that was and i was like yeah sort of you know, I'll try anything once, why not? And um, he took the first one out because you have two pens, don't you? Stabbed me with it and it just fell apart in his hands. It just crumbled to pieces. This like sort of life-saving bit of kit you got just just fell just fell apart. So he, he got the next one out. <laughs> Tried that and that one went in, 100% went in. And I'm like, I didn't want to play up to it. I wanted to just <laughs> keep the face and be like, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> And I just felt my lips start moving. I'm like, oh, you know, like, absolutely, like just, just started chatting shit. I just uncontrollably chatting shit. And apparently I called the Sergeant Major handsome. I tried to chat him up. I said that he looked good in his uniform, like a 20 year mountain leader. And he's just like, shut this fucker up. Um, but we told. You're bad enough when you're sober. Well, honestly, you're bad enough when you're sober, let alone on some fucking drugs. <laughs> yeah, 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 mate. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was just coming out. And I, I don't even know what was coming out of me, but it was it was just flowing out. And uh, yeah, we were waiting to get picked up by the helicopter. An American, uh, like, Pedro team came and they come in two Black Hawk, like, helicopters, like, from the film Black Hawk Down. One circles and one lands. And it kept getting pushed back, you know, like an Uber when you're pissed and you just want to get home. It was just getting pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. And I remember myself getting like irate about it and being like, what the fuck's going on? You know, as you would a bit, you know, but what you don't know is like, that if that gets pushed back, it's because someone needs it a lot more than you do. You know, someone's in a shit state. And I didn't think about that. I'm just thinking about, I want to get back. I want to get sorted. What's going on? 
I get picked up to uh, two mates sort of carried me on to this like helo. I get in, I'm strapped in and, you know, you look up to the roof, the ceiling of the helicopter and it was just blood, just covered in blood from probably the last bloke that had been in there. And you're just like, fucking hell, like that's because you're strapped in like that. You've got to look up. So all you can see is just smeared blood and where it's sprayed or like whatever. Um, mm. so you're strapped in, it takes off, flies like that. So you're strapped in, looking down at an open door, just watching the floor, but like beneath you sort of disappear. And you're just like, Jesus Christ. And you know, at 18 and you're thinking, I actually worked it out with the time difference. All of my mates from home would have still been in sixth form doing work, you know, and you're strapped into a helicopter off for surgery, peppered in frag, just like, what the fuck's going on? No one at home knows anything. And um, I got taken to this American hospital in Afghan. And, uh, well, on the flight there, the American bloke was trying to sort of put a line in me, but the helicopter's shaking like that, isn't it? You know, taking off and... He popped my vein, got blood going everywhere. He's like, put pressure on it, put pressure on it. So I'm like, trying to keep calm here. Like, oh my God, what's going on? But uh, we get to the hospital. You get scanned, don't you? Like a full sort of head to toe scan. And uh, come out, you can see all the bits of frag all over your body. Um, I actually had an MRI last year for my ankle before surgery. And the... They like scan you first to make sure you haven't got anything in you that the magnet can pull out of you. And I've still got frag in there now. <laughs> That's uh, 13 years on. There's still bits in there, which is like crazy. But they show you all, all the bits. And they said like, uh, Marine Coleman, we've got some good news. We've got some bad news. And they're like, the good news is your legs are fine. You're going to keep your legs and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, all right, cool. And, but the bad news is... Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's sound. But the bad news is one of your testicles is going to have to come off. And I was like, <laughs> oh, all right, you know, sound. Uh, I was like, why? <laughs> you know, like, why? Um, he was like, you've got frag on one here. You can see it in, in the scan. And obviously, first thing you do, I checked. And I was like, this it feels fine. It feels all right. You know, I don't think that... It is. And he's like, no, 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 we've scanned it. We're going to have to remove one of your testicles. And I'm thinking like, I'm 18. I'm about to become a Cyclops. And, you know, any chance of kids and everything like that's pretty much gone. So what do I do? So I said, <laughs> I honestly, mate, I think I'm fine. Um, I think you're a bit trigger happy with your old slicey slicey there. And you just want to, I don't know, whip this off. So he got about 10 nurses in for a second third, fourth, fifth fucking opinion. All of them were fit as well. And uh, they came in with really cold hands. I couldn't look cool or, or, or anything like that. I, I look pretty shit. And none of them could find it. Uh, none of them could find it. With sort of looking around and uh, he was like, were you scanned wearing your blast pants? And I was like, yeah. So I had these undershorts on that, you know, that are like, they've, they've got bits of Kevlar in. And I'd never worn them until that day. Not once. I'd never worn them. And my mate, who always wore his, was like, are you taking the pistol? Like, not wearing them. And I was like, they're too hot. And he was like, just wear them. Just fucking wear them. So I was like, all right, fine. I'll wear them for you. And they saved my balls. They were, it was inside the, the, the blast pants. Um, so, so they'd, they'd scan, they'd, wait, hold on. So they'd scanned you with your blast pants, with your blast pants on. And With then these there was a bit yeah. of frag in those, and yeah. that motherfucker from America was going to slice one of your nuts off because he was giving me <laughs> options. He was they... like, "We can put a glass one in. We can have one. We can do this. We can." I was like, "Mate, no, no, no!" I was like, "Sheath that knife and get away from me now." <laughs> so, do you know, do you know yeah. what's hilarious? Is there was a lad? There was a lad in um, when I went up to Scotland because I went to Faz Lane first. And there was a lad, yeah. he used to get on the piss and he had one nut. So I don't know what happened <laughs> to him, but he had one nut and he had a rubber, he had a rubber one in there. Oh. And he used to play a game with a hammer, with a fucking hammer when he got drunk and he put his nut sack on the table and fucking whack it with a hammer, but not tell it, but, but wait, but not tell anyone that he had a rubber nut. <laughs> 
Spend, it, so. fucking, you get fucking hammered on the whiskeys and stuff ready to go into Glasgow on the weekend and he'd start playing around with the lads that he hadn't met before and obviously like there's a group of us now that knew that he had a rubber nut but he'd stick it on the table and be like you, you're fucking you haven't got any balls if you can't fucking smack it with a hammer oh. and you'd see lads like about to do it you know like like the young lads that were like oh you know like I'll, I'll give it a go and you're like, they get to the point, they've got the hammer in their hand, and you're like, fucking no, it's a joke. Like, fuck it, he's got don't a rubber do it, Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> fucking hell. So basically, so basically you, um, you, uh, you've still got two, yeah? Just still got two. Um, Mrs. is uh, pregnant right now. So yeah, the, I've still got two. Oh, <laughs> mate, congrats. Yeah. Thank you, mate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that was, that, that was like week one in Afghan, right? Week one, mate, yeah, um, I went back to hospital. I was in hospital and they said, like, we can send you home, you can get your medal, you can get your bonus, you can get sent home um, and crack on. And I was like, you know, no, I've just got here. I don't want to go home yet. And I sort of don't want to tell my family. I'd rather just stay out here and no one needs to know and we crack on. And that's what I asked. And I, like, persisted with that. And they were like, no, you have to tell your family. Like, you have to, you have to. And, like, the Padre came in and was like, you have to ring them. He said, because what will happen is one of the lads on R&R &R will tell his mate and tell his mate and it'll end up on Facebook and then your parents find out and, you know, you have to tell them. So, rang home and told oh. them, you know, it's not <clears throat> ideal, is it? And mum wasn't too, too impressed. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. And I said, like, I'm, I'm, I'm staying... I did surgery. I had like five rounds of surgery in total because um, it, it didn't work. My stitches wouldn't heal and because of the sand there and shit like that. Walking to and from and um, I went back out for four months. Um, I had my R&R &R and I came back and I was on Sanger one night, you know, on watch. And I was like, oh my God, I'm in pain. And I had this scar on my tailbone just above my ass. And uh I was like, God, it's killing me. It's killing. And it got to the point, because on this Sangha, you were really small. You had to sit. And I couldn't sit. I couldn't sleep at night. I couldn't do anything. And I was just in so much pain. I didn't want to tell anyone, because I didn't want to be a soft lad or anything. And uh, obviously, wrongly. And I showed the medic. Our medic was uh, Kate Nesbitt, um, who's a bit of a, uh, a legend, really. And I showed her. She called a healer when I was out that day. Um, it turned out I'd caught a Afghan flesh eating disease. Um, and where my wound was on my tailbone, it had rotted a hole so big you could see my tailbone. Um, you could see the bone all the way, all the way down. Um, and they were forming these holes all over my body. I've got scars all down my side. Um, and it was just rotting. And they were like, if it gets to your chest and rots a hole like that, it's going to rot a hole through your lung. So I had to go back to England sort of, sort of straight away, begin like quarantining and washing and all this stuff. And, you know, all these like body scrubs and nasal scrubs and hair washes and this and that for months on tablets and antibiotics for months and months and months. And they couldn't get it to go. We've lost you, mate. Kept coming back. Kept oh, you're coming back. back. You're back. You're back. Uh, Kept on coming back. Sorry, I got you. Uh, eventually went. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so I was st stitched up with that for a bit. I going to the hospital and having these holes packed with doctor's thumbs like that, packing them. And I was on laughing gas just trying to get out of the pain, you know, and uh, got rid of that. Pretty much sorted. But after Afghan, I was in a bit of a shit spot mentally. Um, really aggressive, like really, really aggressive. Because, like, I think on the way home from Afghan, everyone goes to Cyprus and everyone gets it out 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 the system. They have a week, everyone pisses up, and you do like your decompression. Yeah, decompress. That's it. But if you get flown home on a medical flight, chances are you're someone who needs decompression more than anyone because something's happened to you. But because you've got to get home urgently, they don't have time to stop you in Cyprus for a week on the piss, you know. So you you miss it. So mm. I'd gone mm. from being on the front line to being on the piss in about 24 hours or straight out. And 
was just in a mental space where I just wanted to fight everyone. It was just all, I just, every night that I went out, I was just trying to get into scraps. I don't know why. It was almost like, explain it that if you were like- We have lost you, mate. I don't know. Oh, you're back in the room. You're back in the room. You keep glitching out a little bit. It seems that, oh, oh, all right, yeah, my end, you froze, but it, it, it looks all right. Um, but yeah, just, I think, I imagine it like if you were a boxer or something like that, and you were walking down the ring to a fight after you'd trained for it for six months, someone blindsided you on the walk to the ring, and then you never got to do your fight. It kind of felt like that, you know, like, mm. um, so a lot of frustration and a lot of like built up anger and mental you know sort of problems that had nowhere to go and that was the outlet i think i think a lot of lads have um issues um with aggression because the problem is we're we're trained to be super aggressive like control controlled aggression but then um like I never, I never went to Afghanistan. So I, I went up to Faz Lane, then I went down to Four Two Commando, and I joined Four Two just as David Cameron had stopped um, the final tour. So the army were doing their cleanup job, and then we went to do like um, anti piracy stuff, which was like a DOS really. Um, cool. But I did. Obviously, you're surrounded by a lot of lads that have been. Um, and looking back on it now, I look at. I I used to look at it as like a missed opportunity, right? Like you like what you say, you do all your training to become a boxer and then you don't get in the ring and actually box. Uh-huh. It, for me it was for me for quite a little while it was like I've trained to be this Royal Marines commando. And yeah, yeah, you do like light operation stuff, but because Afghan was going on at the time, it was like, oh, I've missed out on this thing. But I look at it as a bit of a blessing in disguise now. Um because nearly every single person that I know that's been has a snag of some sort from what they've experienced, how they view society now. Because if you think about it, you were 18 then at that time, and then, you know, you survive a grenade, then you survive this disease afterwards that that sort of catches up with you. Then you also miss out on the decompression. You end up back in the United Kingdom, and you're probably going out with lads similar kind of age to you, but you're probably also surrounded by a bunch of students that are similar age to you that have no concept of what's just happened to you at all. Exactly. No, no respect, yeah. no con. And you're and you're sat there and you're like, this fucking piece of shit that's doing their um, psychology degree has no idea that three months ago I was fighting a war in Afghanistan and got fucking blown up. Yeah. And they're and gobbing think... off to you about fucking some political bullshit that you don't care about and you're sitting there like getting frustrated because you're like, Well fuck you, I'd rather punch your head in than argue with you you know, because that's the kind of mental space that you're in, right? It's massively that, mate, and I think everything in at home <clears throat> that would be a problem to the normal people becomes not a problem to you because your problems are bigger, you know, like, you know, this isn't an issue. You have just seen issues, you know, like, um, whatever someone's Mm. moaning about the washing machines broke or, you know, I don't know, something trivial. And you're just like, you don't understand what a real problem is, but at the same time, they don't understand what you've done. So, you know, you're both putting heads and it's a hard spot to find a a balance. Yeah. It's a balancing act, right? Because, um, when you do, like, obviously, we've both left the Marines now, but when you do leave and you join normal society again, <clears throat> the problems the problems that um, society has, most people have as their normal day-to-day, you know, cars broke or, um, you know, something's gone wrong at home, like you say, washing machine, or you miss the bins on a Friday because you forgot to take them out the day before, like trivial shit that, people get stressed about and they worry about just doesn't really bother us Uh we just go oh you know that can be fixed quite quickly that's not really a big deal um because i suppose when you go through the hardship of sleeping in a shithole in afghanistan or going through your training in the marines and being piss wet through on dartmoor sleeping in bogs and stuff like that getting home to normal shelter sitting on a normal toilet eating a hot meal becomes like a, almost like a gift. 
that you really, yeah. really, really appreciate. Whereas a lot of other people, people, they don't have that appreciation at all, but then also it's not their fault. So it's learning that it's not their fault that they don't have that appreciation. But it's, at the time, it's almost like you kind of have to, at, yeah, you can't because, well, I suppose it just takes time, right? It takes time. Like now, now I look at people's problems and I, and I go, well, that's fine. You can have those problems because I'll excel in my career by not, not caring about those issues. So like, I'll, I'll go into my office in Sydney now and people will be moaning about stuff. And I'm just sitting there like, cool, you guys can keep moaning. I'll keep, I'll keep working harder and pushing on because I don't really see it as a problem, but I'm also going to excel way quicker than you guys are because you keep complaining. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just see it as a benefit now. And rather than getting involved in it, because you do like you went back in the day when you're younger and you're, you're, you're like mid twenties or whatever, you want to argue it. Like you want to go, well, yeah. fuck, you don't know. You don't know yeah, yeah. what I've been yeah. through. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah. fuck it, who cares? Like it, it is what it is, right? It is what it is. Um, but it does take you a while. I think it is difficult. And I do think that the military doesn't have a very good grip on trying to like ease you back into society. Um, no. Like I don't know about you, that final year when I put my notice in because I wanted to leave, there was no support like at all. No. No, no. Um, but there's no, there's no like, if someone does this to you, please don't respond in this way because that's not how they do it back in normal life. <laughs> that was a big shock to me was like um, socially, you know, because I joined the Marines from school. So that acting that way was all that I knew, you know, it was all that I knew. And to then go to Civvy Street and you've probably acted that way around your friends for so long that they've accepted it. So you think, oh, I can do this back at home and this is normal. But then when you go into a job or when you go into wherever and people are like, what the fuck is this? You know, like people don't understand, people don't, you stand out and not for the right reasons. And it takes a long time to realize that you just can't behave like that anymore. And I mean, we all slip into it when we're drunk, don't we? But at the same time, you've got to act professional and you've got to, uh, you've got to carry yourself in a certain way and represent the good aspects of the, of the military and not the, not so good, I'd say, but it's uh, a steep learning curve when you leave to come back to, I, I, I say to come back to normality, but if you've never known that, then you don't know what it is, especially at that age. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Talk to me about what you're doing now, mate, because um, I think a lot of, a lot of ex bootnecks they get into the fitness industry when they leave or they go down the security route or they get into like high level management or start businesses and things like that. But also a lot of lads that do go down that uh, health and fitness route, they always want to kind of like, I, I thought about it when I became a personal trainer, when I left about, you know, how do I help young people get through training? Yeah. Now you've launched this civvy to commando business and I think you've done it excellently. And the okay. the weekends that you're running are awesome. And and if I was a young lad going into training, I would be thinking to myself, I should get on one of these courses just to get a taste or a feel of what it might be like when I get in. <clears throat> yeah, that's it, mate. Um, I've been helping people prepare for the core for ages. You know, when local people say, "Oh, you should add, you should." Add Dave and ask him how to train or something like that. And loads of people were asking for tips. And I was really enthusiastic with it. I'd send them messages that long, you know, loads and loads and loads. And I'd check in with them. How's things? How, how's this? How are you getting on? And get really, like, invested in it. And I didn't realize I was already doing it. And I was sat, I was listening to a podcast um, about how to, not how to make a business, but, you know, for people thinking about it and it was what do you know that not many people do and I was like fucking not a lot really <laughs> but no like <laughs> it basically then you know if you don't know anything about fashion then go in and start in a t-shirt brand or a clothing brand you are starting from the start and you don't know anything you know you are you've got to learn as much as anyone else what do you know no one else does and I was like well there's only 6,000 Marines, say, in like the UK and 60 million people or whatever it is now. It literally is 0.01% of the population or or whatever the maths is. But it, it's, it's, it's pretty much that. 
And I was like, how do you turn that into, into, into a business? How do you, and I was like, I was sat reading a training program that I was paying for. And I was like, God, it's there in my hand. Like I'll do this. I'll do a training program for people that want to join the, uh, are the Royal Marines, help them prepare, teach them everything that I wish that I'd known prior to going because I struggled. I still passed through the mental side of it because I wanted to be there enough. But if I'd have physically prepared and also put in a bit more learning about the actual job that I was going to do, because where people go wrong, a lot of people just think they've got to get fit for the Marines, but you're not training to be fit. You're training to be a soldier. You know, obviously you've got to be fit, but it's a career, it's a job, it's a skill. So we were like, if I could train people in all these things prior to going, then great. So we were doing training programs and then decided to put a weekend camp on to see how it went. Uh, we ended up selling four weekend camps last year, which was brilliant. Really happy. Um, had over you know 300 people through our like one-to-one -one service doing programming. And then relaunched the weekend camps for this year. And in January alone, we'd already sold out nearly four camps um, and another private event. We've actually sold more tickets by right now for 2024 than we did for all of 2023 combined. Um, it's already blown last year out of the water and we're only in February. So it's growing well. People want to do it. Um, and we're having a really mixed crowd. I, I went down the route of just people wanting to join the military. And we're getting loads of civvies come in. We're getting male, female. We're getting 16-year-olds, 55-year-olds, uh, business owners, sports people, whatever. Um, a lot of people who say, I, I wanted to join the military, but I, I got injured or I had asthma. I couldn't join or my son was in, so I, I want to do this. And loads of it. And we're having a really great uptake people are loving it we're moving into corporate and we're doing sort of private corporate events and transferring military skills into the office uh we're going to schools doing talks um we've got a lot on and it's so enjoyable i absolutely love it like the team we've built is brilliant all brilliant lads we all really get on um our passion and our enthusiasm shows i, I think on on the camps and We've had a lot of repeat custom, people who come back to the next camp, come back to the next camp. We've got a lot of people that have done three, have done four, have done all of them. Um, we're trying to build a bit of a long-standing community uh, and keep in touch with these people. I've kept in touch with people as they've gone through basic training. Um, I'm, I speak to them now that they've passed. And now they've passed, I'm asking them to come to the camps, to come and help. Um, so it's good. It's really accomplishing job it's great mate because i it's it's um it's really good that you've because the marines is such a niche right so getting the numbers to to start a business for just six thousand people you know that are actually in the the, the royal marine commandos it, it's difficult to justify a business model right i think that's where a lot of lads would stop because you you're sitting there and you're like well how many people are actually joining this thing like really so expanding it to to civilians and corporate companies um, that can benefit from that military style of leadership and everything yeah. else that's good and great about the military that that normal people can take and use in their everyday corporate jobs or businesses or or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, I I just think it, I think it's an awesome an awesome thing. It is how many how many weekends have you got coming up this year? Have you kind of doubled what you did last year? I'm aiming to quadruple what I did last year. I want to do 16 <laughs> this year is the goal. Uh, events and everything like that. Um, and we're looking good. Um, it, it's definitely possible. Uh, and we're bringing out new products now. So we're doing the normal military weekends, which, you know, everything from yomping with, with weight on, like packing the Bergen, setting up ponchos, making rations, to shooting, hand-to-hand -hand combat, survival, determination tests, camouflage. So we do those. That's the sort of normal military weekend. But now we're going in other directions and we're running survival weekends. So no fitness for people who want to come, but they might not be fit. They might be older. And we'll build shelters. We'll build fire from nothing. We'll, you know 
catch and cook food, uh, treat water, do escape and evasion training, bits and bobs, and crafting like uh, uh, survival tools. And that's gone really well. Um, we're also starting up an, uh, a, a new one for this year, 24 hour fitness challenge called Hell Weekend. And the idea is people will come to us at midday on the Saturday and all they know is they'll finish at midday on the Sunday if they can keep up. And it's a case of follow on. You don't know what's coming. You hand in your phone, you hand in your watch. So you don't know what time it is. You've got no concept of how long you've done. Um, they'll be up during the night. They'll be cold. They'll be wet. It'll be hard. And everyone gets three strikes. If you can't keep up, you'll get one strike. If you drop out of something, you get two strikes. You know, if you get three strikes, you get took back to the train station, you go home, you fail. That's it. End of story. So we're launching that this year. We've already sold a lot of tickets for that. Looking really popular. Uh, a lot of people who are into the sort of David Goggins style fitness and all of that stuff are really starting to jump on. And the fear of failure, I think, is a really cool thing for people because it brings out a higher level of performance when you know that it's sort of do or die. So, yeah, we're excited for that one. Mate, you're like an, an extreme, uh, an extreme high rocks. That's exactly it, mate. <laughs> twenty four, exactly twenty four hour, twenty four hours, just crack on, um, do or die. No, I like it. It's good. It's good to have failing in there, right? Because a lot of people sign up to courses and it's a guaranteed pass. Um, so to have something on your roster where people actually can fail, I think that's a, I think that's a cool thing to do. I think that with regards to one thing I'd spoke to, obviously a lot of people are talking about, um, the lack of uptake in the military recently, right? With yeah. all of this stuff going on in the East. Um, and they were talking about bringing back, um, national service to a degree. I don't think you really should bring back necessarily national service, but I do think for those people that are not sure um, about what they want to do at college or not sure about what they want to potentially do at university, I think coming on a course like yours is a great way of <clears throat> giving you a bit of perspective, going through something really difficult, it kind of opens your eye up to things. Um, also just gives you a, a bit of a base layer. Um, because I think for like, if anyone, if anyone's listening to this and they're and they're struggling and their parents are saying you got to do this and I want you to get a degree and I need you to go and you know the amount of successful bootnecks that don't have a bloody GCSE that I know is unbelievable. So there's got to be yeah. something within the military training, right? That obviously puts us on a pedestal that other employers or people that headhunt um, individuals they want people like us to join their companies. Because we have yeah. leadership, we have timekeeping skills, we can look after ourselves, we've got a can-do attitude. Um, if we're not very good at you're something, we'll at least give sick. it a go. Yeah, you're, you're not, not going to call, call in sick. sick. So I think, I think yeah, exactly. So I think, you know, the, the, the stuff that you're doing is actually really helpful. And I think that anyone that's in your area, um, obviously, I imagine you're going to expand as well, um, should, should, if they're, if they're, in that sort of like, oh, maybe I should have a job change or maybe I should, uh, I don't know what college course to go on. I'm not sure about going to university. Maybe I want to go traveling for a little bit first. Maybe they should come on a course like yours and just sort of go, right, okay. Like, yeah, this this is this is going to set, because you gain a bit of clarity going on something like that. Um, it, we've had people, because there's, mate, like we, we <laughs> like, and without sounding cheesy, but I know it's true. We've changed people's lives on it and not like you come down for two days and then my life's changed forever. It's not like that, but people come down and go, you know what? I want to go and do this now. This is, this is for me. And they've joined up and they've stayed in, in touch. And some, uh, some people who maybe weren't so confident, they come along and they realize they are capable of quite a lot and they change their life, um, off off the back of it, they go, you know what? I have got something about me or people who don't really socialize. They don't really see other people and they don't put themselves themselves against other people come down with 32 people, get put on a, an even playing field and have a chance to sort of see where they stack up and go, you know what? I'm not a million miles off here. I'm a little bit better than what I thought. Maybe I should give something a go that I've been scared to do. Cause I, I was, I've always been like, 
I'm rubbish, I'm this, I'm that, I put myself down, you're never going to pass this because of that. And when you actually throw yourself in there with other people, you go, you know what, I'm not that bad. Like, I- I'm not as bad as I've-, as I've said to myself. And people surprise themselves because in the modern day, look, people don't want to be uncomfortable because they don't think the <laughs> they can do it but the second they're in that position they actually do a lot better than they thought they would and I think there's a lot to be said for going and doing something outside your comfort zone and seeing what you're capable of and also seeing things and meeting people you would never have met you know we've got a group chat from March last year from March's weekend camp and it pings every day people in there talking meeting up uh, doing challenges together, doing Tough Mudder together, meeting for coffee, meeting for beers, doing whatever, networking. Um, it's great. They all stay in touch now and it's a, a really good thing. Awesome. Mate, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Thanks for coming on. Um, we're going to put all of your details in the comments. Uh, it'll be all over YouTube, um, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere that you listen to your podcast, we'll get it up in the next week or so. Um, but yeah, appreciate you coming on, mate. Keep, keep, uh, I'm glad you got both your testicles and, um, <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll do this again soon for sure. We'll do this again soon. I'll have to name my uh, first child after that surgeon from the hospital or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 anyway guys cheers for that thanks Dave have a good one in a bit